This is Joel Duff. If you've read any of my articles on thenaturalhistorian.com or watched any of my other videos here on this YouTube channel, you might be thinking to yourself as you look at this title, wow, what's he got himself into today? This doesn't sound like a interesting science story that he's going to put some kind of uh, faith spin on, right, and talk about uh, how we should understand it in the context of our Christian faith. No, I'm taking, uh, I'm diverging from my usual fare, and it's not without some trepidation, since I'm going to be talking about racism and interracial adoptions and uh, some controversy there is within the church. Uh, but I feel strongly that um, uh, organizations like Answers in Genesis, which you may usually think of as a creation science organization or a creation science apologetics organization, an organization that, that attempts to provide answers from science, uh, that back up and support uh, a particular interpretation of the scriptures. And that's true, but if you've followed Answers in Genesis for any length of time, you'll know that in the last 15 to 20 years, and especially in the last five years, um, they've become much, much, much more than just talking about science issues in the church. In fact, they don't even talk that much about science. Uh, they're really about uh, providing answers to the church about all questions of, uh, and all social issues. And uh, reflecting that, uh, they have made some edits to their statement of faith. All right, so if you go to their website, you look at their, their statement of faith. It's not something that say like, you know, here's what our employees ascribe to. Here's what all people that work for Answers in Genesis need to say, like, these are their beliefs. Uh, they've added a lot of requirements, I guess you could say, to, uh, uh, to being able to be employed there. And some of, most of those uh, have little to do with uh, you know, science issues. So it's, they're not just about Adam and Eve or the nature of the global flood or how old the earth is or what their view of evolutionary biology is. Um, but they very much have to do with other social issues, in particular social justice, uh, uh, critical race theory, and so forth. And that's the thing that I want to talk about today. Uh, and I want to see how... Uh, Answers in Genesis as an organization uh, has become a powerful force in terms of shaping the positions and opinions of, of members of the church, of the evangelical church. Uh, but it's important to know what their presuppositions and assumptions are uh, behind that. And so I think I can highlight some of that by looking at a recent squabble or, and it's not really a squabble because Bethany Christian Services isn't making a big deal about this uh, with Answers in Genesis, but Answers in Genesis, and Ken Ham in particular, is certainly calling out a Christian organization, Bethany Christian Services, for being anti-biblical and being racist. Right, these are very inflammatory uh, words and very strong uh, statements uh, from Answers in Genesis. So what's really going on here? What's behind that? Why are they so upset uh, about uh, this Christian adoption agency? Like I said, this is, uh, this is a difficult territory. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I am not going to try to explain all the nuances of racial theory uh, and uh, different approaches that Christians have had uh, to racism and the problem of racism, or in the case of Answers in Genesis, I'm basically saying that racism doesn't exist in a way or shouldn't exist, uh, ideally, and acting like it doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, because I'm, I'm no expert in this area, but what I am good at is looking at how uh, organizations um, find information, how they report information, and how they influence others uh, to follow those particular views. And that's what I want to explore here is some of the statements that they have made and, and what they're grounding them in. So here we go. I was intrigued by a title, a clickbaity title, so it grabbed me, right? Uh, Ken Ham on May 13, 2021, wrote this blog post, Christian Agency Doesn't Want White Families Adopting Black Children. You're like, how can you not read that, right? Well, what are they talking about? Christian Agency Doesn't Want White Families Adopting Black Children? And here he reports on a conversation and a discussion that was had on the Answers News Live program. So Answers in Genesis, as an organization, uh, they promote a, a, a time twice a week on Facebook Live in which they have employees, and sometimes Ken Ham himself, come on, and they talk about, uh, they read news items, right? So essentially they, they read news articles. And then they reflect upon those articles. They say, like, what should we think as Christians? You know, they, they are 
placing themselves in the position as we are a Christian organization and we are providing answers to the, to the evangelical Christian world. Uh, and here's what you should believe about this as well. So they react to the news and they give their particular, I'm going to call it spin on that particular news and their interpretation. And so what they've done is they, they read an article in Breibart uh, that talks about uh, this, this, this uh, agency that doesn't want white, family, uh, white families adopting black children. And Ken Ham then writes a blog post on it, which then further uh, elevates the, 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 this because he puts it on Facebook and Twitter and so forth and gets people to read this. And so what are people reading? What are they seeing? What are they being told? Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple things. He's, he's saying Bethany is openly advocating for racism and discrimination in adopting families. Um, he's also saying this agency wants to overhaul the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act. We'll look at that in a moment. This act bars racial discrimination in placing children into an adoptive family. All right, that, that sounds like a, I mean, on the surface of it, that sounds like a very good thing, right? And they want it overturned. Now, this is, this is um, triggering language, right? Overturned, right? You know, if, if um, Ken Ham or a politician talks about overturning something, we talk about overturning uh, you know, Obamacare or something like that. When we get rid of it, that's what it sounds like. And then he says that Christian, Bethany Christian Services uh, says they, they, they want w allowing white families to adopt black children from foster care system. He says that they say that can cause a lot of harm to children of color. And therefore, all right, so this is what Bethany Christian Services, that's actually a statement from one of their documents that we will look at in a moment. Uh, and Ken Ham then says, and therefore a child's race should be considered as part of the best interest determination of child placement. All right, now as I said, there's a ton of loaded language here and, um, and, and I can't get into all the nuances of, of the different uh, theories uh, behind how um, adoptions work and the considerations that should be there, but I'll, I'll try to address a few of them. But this is sort of this is the way that Ken Ham is presenting the situation uh, that Bethany Christian Services is in to the rest of the evangelical world. They're saying, look, they're racist. They want to overhaul this uh, act, which uh, had essentially barred in his, his in his ways in his terms racism um, from the adoption process, and they want to bring racism back into this adoptive process it is essentially the message that I think he's communicating. And if you watch the, the Answers Live um, thing, they're, they use a lot of pejorative words uh, in this, and that's exactly the feeling you get. It's like, they are really the racist, we're not racist, and what we're trying to do is say that, hey, we're com we don't believe in looking at color at all, and anyone who does look at color has uh, some kind of problem because they must be racist. Um, Answers in Genesis, I'll just stop here for a second. I'll say that Answers in Genesis, for a long time, and I think, and I'll, I will say, I'll, I, yeah, I'll give Ken Ham credit and um, his, his, some of his followers and his employees, is they have made a big deal about racism uh, within the church calling out uh, problems of racism within the church. And they've been proting a, what, what's called a, a form of san, scientific anti-racism. Uh, scientific anti-racism is this idea that, uh, which, they, which they are promoting, which is if you look at the science uh, of race, there really isn't any difference between us, right? We're, we're all very similar. People of different skin colors in particular, um, they only differ by a couple of alleles in uh, a couple genes. And that there's a gradation, right? And their their phrase that they often use, and they use in this particular program, is there are many shades of brown. There is no black and white, right? And that that's I that, that's that's a really good. I don't mind that. It's a, a good saying. There are many shades of brown, right? There's a continuum uh, in terms of actual skin tones, but underneath, when you look at inside, you look at the rest of the genetics of people. Um, we're all very, 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 very similar, and there really isn't any race in that way. And so this all, it, this all sounds fantastic uh, when they say it. And they say, like, okay, so therefore we shouldn't be racist, and the church shouldn't be racist, and nobody should be racist because everybody's made in the image of God. We're all equal in the, in the sight of God, right? No individuals are placed higher than others in any 
uh, meaningful characteristic uh, in terms of because we all have this same uh, image of God. So all of that sounds absolutely completely palatable and a wonderful thing. However, there are some problems with this. And um, I'm going to start with the source of information and then eventually I want to look at Bethany Christian Services and their statements and what are they saying and what is the difference between, what is the argument between Answers in Genesis, the root issue between Answers in Genesis and Bethany Christian Services. So my first issue uh, has to do with the source of information that Answers in Genesis uses in order to promote and uh, attack Bethany Christian Services. In their Answers Live, they read this article from Breitbart News. Uh, and the title there is Christian Adoption Agency Opposes International Adoptions, or sorry, inter Interracial Adoptions, uh, written by John Nolte. And if you've read anything else by John Nolte on the Briar 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 Bart website, you'll know that he's certainly no expert in interracial adoptions. Uh, what he is an expert in is um, uh, spinning news uh, to uh, promote a particular ideology. Um, he very much is there to um, take news and to um, spin it toward a very strong alt-right uh, and very particular view of history uh, and of politics. All right, that doesn't mean that there, there isn't truth in this particular article, but you have to know that um, he is going to once he's decided something is wrong, he's going to use extremely strong language and he's also going to use uh, very much cherry-picked information. And so when I read the article, honestly, I couldn't tell what Bethany Christian Services is really saying uh, because he doesn't provide enough information there. Um, but the Answers in Genesis live uh, news group very much picks up on the language of Nolte in this particular article. It uh, doesn't sound like they actually went to Bethany Christian Services and read their original language and read their original document from which this news item partially came. In fact, Nolte here quotes several other people uh, who then have also written articles that are uh, rather strong, uh, uh, strong reactions to Bethany Christian Services. And so it's sort of like... Uh, one person is picking up on the strong language and inferences from another person, and then Answers in Genesis is picking up on the inferences from Nolte, and then even accentuating them even more. Uh, rather than just going to the source, and this is, this is the other thing that uh, I have trouble with with Answers in Genesis and really a lot of Christian organizations, is that Ken Ham is out there attacking Bethany Christian Services as a Christian organization Ken Ham's well enough known that he could pick up the phone and talk to the uh, CEO of Bethany Christian Services, and they could he could ask, "What are you really saying?" And, you know, we could talk about uh, what your position is, and he could talk about how he thinks that they are in error, and they could figure out where their differences lie. Um, and at the end of the day, they still disagree. He could publicly talk about what he sees as a danger in what Bethany Christian Services is saying. Um, but to just come out in public and directly attack Bethany Christian Services um, without really trying to, as a Christian, work out um, their differences uh, not in public. Um, that's my first problem with, with how this is all approached and, and it kind of upsets me. Um, all right, so the Briar Byrd article. I thought to myself as I looked at this, I wanted to know. All right, is Bethany Christian Services really a racist organization? All right, should I be supporting Bethany Christian Services? Should I also be um, uh, discouraging friends and family who might be thinking of adopting from going to Bethany Christian Services because of their particular position uh, on this issue? And so I thought, eh, you know, maybe I better read their original document and find out, like, what are they saying? What are they actually saying uh, about this? And so I found this um, uh, 2021 report in which they talk about the past year, the challenges of COVID, and what they've learned over the last year. And it's kind of their, also their annual report of, of like what's happening in, this, in the ministry and what do they see as future challenges. 
In this report, they communicate a bunch of really interesting information uh, about their adoptions. They have collected a, an enormous amount of data. There's a number of graphs at the, at the bottom of the report which are very interesting. Uh, and in there, they begin to talk about, uh, you know, one of the things they talk about is assessing disparate outcomes. And by disparate outcomes, they mean, okay, we have data that shows um, the race of individuals that have entered the program, right? Kids needed to be adopted. We have information on the racial and ethnic um, uh, information about those who are in fostering children and adopting children. And then we have many years of data of them being in those families. And we can ask uh, questions about uh, outcomes, right? How successful are those different outcomes from different uh, um, of combinations of, of race? And what they find is there's a disparate outcomes. Now, disparate outcome means that, um, that certain combinations don't result in as much success their measure of success is a successful adoption that you end up uh, in a permanent home. And so blacks that are placed in white families are much less likely to end up in that permanent uh, situation. And so they're simply saying, hmm, there's nothing simple here. They're suggesting that if you have data that suggests disparate outcomes, that that disparate outcome then should be considered as part of your criteria, something you should be thinking about as you're placing families, as you're placing children. If a child has a much less chance, much less chance of succeeding in a particular combination or particular racial situation, then is it fair to the child to place them in that situation where they have much less chance of success? That's essentially what Bethany Christian Services is, is sort of asking. And, and what they're saying is needs to be cons at least considered in the process. Nowhere in this document is saying that white families should never and shouldn't um, adopt black children or that it's a terrible idea, right? They're simply saying maybe we need to at least consider race as we think about adoptions. Now, this is a rather inflammatory idea uh, to some and to others not. And this would be true in the you know, Caucasian and in the black community. What we recommend, so here's where we, here's where we get into, here's where they get into, I'll say, some trouble. Uh, they should, uh, they recommend that governments at all levels should reduce the barriers to permanency that children face, right? And that's one of the goals of, of, of the various legislation that has already been passed, trying to make it easier for children to become adopted, not only to get in foster care, but to find permanent homes. That's, that's the goal, right? Uh, and it's always been known that uh, there are more black children in the system and that the success rate has been very low in the past. And so there has been new legislation, specifically in 1974, that will look at the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, which uh, was meant to make the system race blind and be able to say that adoption should be open to anyone and no one should be looking at race when they're placing. And that should help more individuals because I mean the idea was that well maybe white families are less likely to adopt black children they're more likely to adopt white children therefore black children are getting left behind so if we say that all races you can't look at race you can't consider race and the adoption agency should just place as they see fit without without looking at uh, skin color then um, that should help set the system up to be able to adopt more black children since there are more black children in the system that coming into the system. That sounds great. I mean, that, that, I don't know about great, but that sounds like a, um, a reasonable hypothesis and a, uh, something that was worth doing. All right, so in 19, uh, sorry, sorry, it's not 1974, 1994, under Bill Clinton. They are also asking that data collection, stratification by race, contextualization must be required of all public and private children welfare providers. Saying, we do need to collect data because if you don't collect data, you can't know whether you have a problem or not. Um, and as I guess as a scientist, I'm always for, for collecting data. 
Uh, some people don't want to collect data because they want to say that there isn't a race problem and you shouldn't ask about race, right? You shouldn't even consider race at all, in which case you're tempted not to even collect information about race. But if you don't collect information about race and ethnic uh, background, then you may be missing trends uh, and things that are happening. You might be missing the fact that there's racism going on, all right? And that there are people that are prioritizing, uh, maybe not overtly or outwardly, but they are implicitly or even um, doing it without even knowing it, they have biases. Uh, and so you need to collect that data and analyze. And they're saying when we analyze the data, we see a, a, a strong correlation uh, between different kinds of adoptions, different adoption combinations that are less successful than others. And therefore, we need to consider how to ameliorate that. And part of ameliorating that might be um, changing this act, right? So you say the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act has contributed to disparate outcomes. They're saying it was well-intentioned, right? To be race blind and just say, place, place families. Don't think at all about race and ethnic background when you're placing children in different homes. And that had a, there was a reason to do that. And it was well-intentioned. Nobody had bad reasons for doing this but it has contributed to disparate outcomes, right? The data now are in, in their mind, that it hasn't helped in many ways. In fact, it might have made some things worse. It should be overhauled. Now, remember Ken Ham's language? He said that they say that it should be overturned. He suggested that Bethany Christian Sayers is saying we should just overturn this act, as if, oh, well, they wanted it, you know, the, the MIPA was race blind, and didn't treat individuals as if they were uh, members of different races because all people are equal. And now they're trying to overturn that. They're trying to say people aren't equal, right? And that we should be considering race and we should be having a bias. We should be racist is what Ken Ham's saying. I don't think at all that they're saying that we should be racist. Um, he's say, they're saying it should be overhauled to allow a child's race to be considered as part of the best interest determination for child placement and hold agencies accountable for data-informed, diligent recruitment and racially ethnic diverse resource families. All right. That act already says that you should, they should be recruiting more diverse families um, in, a, in a way. They're not saying we're completely race blind. We understand that race is somehow in is in ethnic background is important. And so we are encouraging more individuals of different ethnic backgrounds to be foster parents. And so they're actively recruiting that. But even though they've actively recruited it, they're not allowed, uh, at least um, for the most part, although I've read the rules from MIPA and there are, there are always exceptions. Uh, to this rule. But generally, you have to be race blind and you have to, okay, well, okay, so we have all these uh, ethnically diverse uh, foster parents available, but if we have a child here and we don't know, we're not, we're not going to consider whether they're white or black in where we, re where we place them. And um, Bethany Christian Services is saying, I think it's, it may be okay. I think that it's not the determining factor but we need to consider their race as part of, uh, uh, as potentially leading to a healthier, more successful relationship. Now, um, I think that Ken Ham in Answers in Genesis are absolutely correct that all people are created in the image of God and they're all equal uh, in this sense. But I find a little bit ironic that Ken Ham uh, wants complete racial blindness in the sense that it's like not acknowledging what he knows about the world, which he knows the world is a sinful place. The world is corrupted by sin. And to act as if race makes no difference, um, it's theoretically shouldn't make difference. Like, ideally, it shouldn't make any difference because we are all made in the image of God. We are all equal. And skin color shouldn't make any difference in terms of um, our success and our ability to interact and raise a child. Uh, but the reality of the world is, is that racism does exist. And I was going to go as far as to say that I do believe that systematic, systemic racism exists. Now, this is where I'm getting 
this is where I, you know, you know, this is where the trouble begins, because actually Ken Ham is saying that uh, Bethany Christian Services believes that there is systemic racism, and they, and that's why they say they're an anti-racist organization. What they're saying is that we're working against systematic racism. Ken Ham doesn't really believe there's systematic racism. And you're hearing this in politics all around us, right? Some people are saying, well, there are racist, but um, the world isn't, that our country isn't systematically racist, right? It's not, a, it's not in the system that it's racist. Uh, and there might be individual bad cops, but uh, police aren't um, systematically, all right? Systemically, I'm sorry, I'm saying that word wrong. I'm going to systemically uh, racist. Right. I'm not, I don't want to get into all that argument. What I wanted to say is that's really what's lying underneath the surface here. Um, Ken Ham is saying, okay, yeah, all right, there's racists out there, but um, um, those are individual cases. Um, Bethany Christian Service is saying this is a systemic problem, and we need to counteract that, and we think we have the data that suggests that it's real, uh, and for the better outcome of our, the, those who we're trying to place, we want them to be in the best chance for them to have success. Um, and they're saying we might need to consider race as part of that. Uh, does that make them racist? Right? Now, some people would say yes, and others would say no. Uh, Ken Ham certainly is saying yes. All right, let's go a little, dig a little bit deeper into this. The Multi-Ethnic Placement Act of 1994. Interesting, that was passed by uh, Bill Clinton, but it was part of a much larger uh, school reform act. Um, and uh, there was an amendment that involved uh, indigenous um, uh, uh, Americans. Uh, intended to remove barriers to adoption for children of color in foster care by pr prohibiting a child or family's race from being a factor like being a factor at all, while while intention has substantially failed to achieve its stated intent, right? And that can be shown, right? The data shows that it hasn't really achieved that particular goal. Um, so children of color continue to linger in foster care. The law also prevents social workers from ensuring the protection and support of black children's cultural heritage within their temporary and permanent homes. Further, it prevents professional social workers from assessing whether a family is qualified or un unprepared to appropriately parent a child of another race. In other words, they can't even talk about, it. here's some of the problems you might face. Uh, here's some of the issues that you might have to deal with if you have a child, um, a black child and a white family. Here's the things that that black child may feel. Or, I mean, they, they can give training if the family asks. But if they don't ask, they're not allowed to say. They're not allowed to actually try to help or point these things out because that would be trying to influence. That would be that would be sort of like trying to uh, uh, that would be impacting uh, it in a way that uh, the law says that we're blind to that. If we're blind to it, we can't tell you that there's there actually is influences. Uh, and um, what else do I want to say? All right, the MEPA should be overhauled um, to reinstate permissible considerations. Language should be stricken. All right. Uh, all right, that's right. The, the permissible conditions uh, statement was actually removed from it, which made it more race blind. They want it put back so that they can consider a cultural, ethnic, and racial background of the child as a capacity of prospective foster or adoptive parent to meet the needs of the child, such background, uh, and so on and so forth. All right, so here's where, here's where the difference is. So I went and I actually looked at Human uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and I read this really interesting, um, they have a really interesting PowerPoint, which is basically teaching those who are interested in becoming social workers uh, how they would actually implement, all right, how they would be compliant with this Multi-Placement Act of 1994. And it's a fascinating read because it's all the rules about, like, you can't say this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't consider this. You know, if, if, unless somebody asks, you could actually tell them something, but you can't give them, you can't suggest anything about individual uh, uh, parent based on race. All right, so I know, I'm rambling. Let's move on. 
So let's move on to what the title of my uh, talk was, because I talked, I called it Statements of Faith. And uh, all of this is really background to just point this out about Answers in Genesis. All right, so here's just a little fragment of their new Statement of Faith. And a lot of these components were already there, but they've amended some of them. So things like there's only one human, there's only one race of, of mankind. The human race, or Adam's race. Adam and Eve are the first two humans. All people alive today are descendants of Adam and Eve. Right? That's a core belief of Answers in Genesis. We're all descendants from Adam and Eve, and therefore we are all made in God's image, and we're all uh, equal, and we're all genetically related on that way. Since all humans are made in the image of God, all humans have equal dignity and value regarding, uh, regardless of age, intelligence, gender, physical ability, shade of skin tone, religion, ethnicity, or any other characteristic. Very laudatory uh, statement in the sense that it is saying that we are made in God's image and they're, they're very much trying to uh, cast shade all right, on other Christians who historically have had biases. Uh, and, um, and even use the Bible to promote different forms of racism. Um, that there were different uh, castes, basically, of people uh, in God's kingdom. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The concepts of social justice, intersectionality, and critical race theory, CRT, are anti-biblical and destructive to human flourishing. Now, let me tell you, Bethany Christian Services is definitely influenced by critical race theory. Right, because critical race theory is about systemic racism in society, and to overcome systemic racism, there are different. Well, there's arguments about how you would overcome that, but some CRT theorists uh, would propose that there needs to be. Um, this is where like quotas come from. That you need to hire a certain number of people in certain diverse areas in order to promote diversity. And others would argue against that and say, well, oh no, but we're all made in the image of God, we're all equal, we're equal in physical ability, you know, religion, ethnicity, all those things, um, those shouldn't be considered at all. Um, they're saying like, if you don't consider though, there's an implicit Im a bias there that you have to overcome. And the only way to overcome it is to possibly, is to potentially um, pass laws, right, have, have um, various forms of regulations that then require you to do things to help promote diversity. It's not just going to happen by itself. That's, that's one of the things that critical race theory gets into. And that's also a, a part of intersectionality, right? But the concept of social justice, none of these things are defined here. Now, critical race theory, I think a lot of people think they know something about, but um, I would dare say that very few people actually understand critical race theory, and certainly those who are talking about the evils of critical race theory, most of them don't have any idea what it is. Um, and I'm not claiming that I'm any expert on it either. I just know that when I hear others talk about it, I can tell they don't know anything about it. It's kind of like when I read, when I hear Answers in Genesis talk about Bethany Christian Services, and then I see them using a Breitbart article to get their information and sort of get their viewpoint from, I know they haven't really done the work to figure out what does Bethany Christian Services really believe. Now, in this case, Bethany Christian Services really is influenced by modern uh, critical race theory. Uh, and they are, as they even say themselves, uh, anti-racist. Right? And anti-racist means that they are actively pursuing not diversity. All right? They're actively pursuing uh, means to become more diverse uh, and rather than just saying we're blind to uh, 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 we're, we're completely blind to race uh, and so however the racial mix comes out is however it comes out uh, okay so now what do I have what's the problem here there's no definition to social justice on Answers in Genesis website there's no articles about that. There's no. There's one article in which somebody talks about intersectionality, and there's really only one article that talks about critical race theory on Answers in Genesis website. All of these seem to have kind of confused views of these, but these are all buzzwords, clearly, right? 
I mean, you realize that these are all hot button issues in, for, in, in, in social issues today. And so they've thrown these into their statement of faith. The concepts of these things are anti-biblical and destructive to human flourishing. Right? These are buzzwords that are meant to signal to their followers, oh, these are good guys. Right? I would even say, I would go as far as to say that, in a way, Angels and Genesis is not trying to bring many people into the fold. They're simply trying to appease their base to maintain what they have. I mean, this is, this, is, this is all language that politicians use, and they use these words as catchwords, not truly understanding them, but knowing that just by saying that I'm opposed to this will cause you to then say, oh, you're one of my kind, right? And as a result, I know that I'm safe with you. This is just safety language. This is just appeasing a base set of individuals and saying, yes, see, we're all right. And since, since you agree with us on this, even though you might not understand you know, what, what these issues are, but we're saying the things that you think that you, we should be saying, and therefore you can trust us on all these other issues, all right, with science and so forth, because we're the good guys. Um, this, is, this is a way to, um, it certainly isn't a way to broaden your base. But of course, they see broadening their base as, as a way of appeasing, and appeasing isn't really being truly biblically faithful. But my problem here is that they're, uh, they're saying they're anti-biblical and destructive to human flourishing. Um, you, if you're going to go out and say that this is a statement of faith that, that individuals have to ascribe to, then I think you need a really good defense of that statement. You need a very good, tight, biblical defense that these issues, these concepts are completely wrong and anti-biblical. I'm not sure they can do that. They certainly can't do it with these two verses. All right? Others have looked at these two verses, and I'm not going to uh, spend any time on those right now, but uh, go ahead and look them up and see if they prove to you uh, that uh, critical race theory and intersectionality are anti-biblical. Uh, there are anti-biblical uh, elements to those things, for sure. And there are individuals who are, in, who are uh, part of the, like critical race theorists who uh, you know, I would have uh, very much disagree with. Um, but to say that the concepts, and really they're saying concepts here, and that's, a, that's a, kind of a, like a, a word they're using that they're going to they're gonna be able to nuance around if somebody complains. Um, but essentially, they're trying to throw out all these. Anyone who ever would mention that they're using anything, using any like portion of social justice theory or portion of critical race theory, um, is then suspect, right? Now, I don't know what their, their alternative is. Uh, here's the one article that was written about critical race theory in the church in, in, on Answers in Genesis website. It's written by Brandon Clay and Frost Smith. What do I know about Brandon Clay and Frost Smith? I know absolutely nothing about them because I have done a lot of searching for Brandon Clay and Frost Smith. And you know what? The only place that I can see that they exist are as names on articles on Answers in Genesis website. And if you've watched my other videos, you'll know that I've, I've done a whole video on uh, pseudonyms used in um, creationist websites. And uh, I didn't include these two, but I think I should probably include them because I think Frost Smith and Brandon Clay are pseudonyms. I don't know who they are. They might be the same person. Um, they might be somebody else who also writes on a different name on Anxious and Just website, or they're totally anonymous and uh, um, individuals out there. So I don't know what their qualifications are. I have no idea what their qualifications are to write on this topic. I do know after reading this article and having read a lot about critical race theory, um, that I don't think that these two know what they're talking about. Um, they seem to have just picked up on information written by others, other critiques, uh, and they haven't really gone to any source material. And so here they are, here's Answers in Genesis, putting out a statement of faith, which is saying, we need you to ascribe to this statement of faith that you believe, these are the things that we believe, and yet we can barely even defend our beliefs. Uh, it's not much of a calling card for having a lot of confidence uh, in Answers in Genesis. Um, 
All right, lots of pejorative language again in this particular article. Uh, and, and they're setting themselves up as, as it's, it's us against them, uh, rather than promoting their own particular uh, you know, a phrase with, with respect to racism, which is, there are many shades of brown, there's no black and white. Uh, but at the end of the day, they make everything black and white, and they say there's no shades of gray, right? There's nothing in between. You're either all for them, uh, and everybody else is completely wrong. Yeah, there might be portions and pieces of many other people's ideas um, which have value. Uh, and so we shouldn't throw out the baby with the, the bathwater. Uh, just like I would say that Ken Ham's view uh, of, of racism needs a lot of nuancing. Um, it's oversimplified. It, it's very much a black and white thing when really there's a lot of gray area there. Uh, gray is probably the wrong word there. I think there's a lot of additional nuance that's important to understand so that you can actually be sensitive. And, and I think this idea that we live in a sinful world also means you need to acknowledge that sin has changed the way people actually perceive uh, one another and those perceptions make a difference. Those perceptions change people's lives and impact people's lives. Um, and so just ignoring those perceptions as if, well, ideally those don't exist, right? Race doesn't exist, so therefore racial problems don't exist. They exist because of sin. We know we live in a sinful world, therefore we may actually have to deal with that sinful world. Um, and that's going to require a more nuanced um, response and uh, way to deal with racism than simply calling it non-existent. All right, well, that's, uh, that's a long, rambly set of thoughts uh, about uh, answers in Genesis and... Um, their view of adoption and uh, really what is their um, underlying skepticism of a number of different uh, uh, social movements. And uh, I guess the reason I felt compelled to talk about this is because I think that it's, it's important to understand that Answers in Genesis is shaping the viewpoints of many other followers. Now, some might say, are they really shaping the views of their followers, or are they actually shaped by their followers? And I, I, there could be merit to that as well. I think that in some ways they know who their audience is, and in order to continue to curry favor with them and get donations from them, they kind of need to say these things. And so um, it's, it's sort of a yin and yang. They're both pushing and pulling. They're both, uh, they're both influencing each other. Uh, and so as Fox News and Breyerbart and others um, know that they can grab people's attention and hold them to uh, and scare them away, all right, from the boogeyman, all right, from these scary ideas that are out there that are going to impact your lives and affect you. Um, as they do that, of course, their audience very much is influenced by that, and so they themselves actually have to continue to promote that. But I happen to think that they themselves actually believe that as well, uh, and so they are actively promoting it. They're not simply reflecting their audience. I think that they are uh, they're in sync with their audience, but I think they're also pushing their audience even further uh, and, and trying to continue to promote uh, those particular ideas. All right, yeah, this was uh, kind of scary stuff for me to talk about. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not the most, art, you know, it's hard for me to articulate some of these things because there are things that I've, I've only recently been thinking about a lot. And, but these types of, just researching this has, has given me a lot to think about. Uh, and I hope that maybe something in here has made you think, oh, I would like to look into this more. Like, what does this really mean? What, what's really going on here? You know, when you dig below the surface of people's statements, um, what is the thing they're really scared of, uh, ultimately? Uh, and are these things really biblical-based arguments, or are they more socially driven arguments that we then try to plug the Bible into? It's like we try to find support for something that maybe we already believe. And in that way, I think that uh, we're, we actually see a form, forms of racism that occur among those who say they're not racist, um, and they constantly find the Bible to try to try to turn to the Bible to to justify and continue to justify their beliefs. Um, all right.
thanks a lot. Uh, again, you can find my writings, which are very different than this, uh, on thenaturalhistorian.com. And uh, go check out my pictures uh, if you want something more pleasant to look at and feel awe-inspired uh, versus kind of the downer that, that I have been today. Hey, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.